All right, hello. My name is Ted Ronnie. I'm head of business development for, for WAP here. I'm going to talk about what we call next best action, right? Some best practices for a winning portfolio strategy. Um, not about the metaverse, but, you know, it's a little quick, you know, apologies about that. Um, though we are beginning. Let's get the clicker going. Uh, that's the right one. There we go. Cool. A little bit just quickly about the company. Um, we've been, you know, a little over seven years now. Um, primarily, simply put, we help mobile game companies make more money outside of core gameplay. We do that with a couple um, sort of portfolio solutions. One is pricing optimization, so optimizing IEPs, so what's the right price, right time, right location. We also complement that with engagement application solutions. Um, loyalty program be kind of one of the more dominant one along that too. And Yes, we are getting into metaverse as well. We're taking some of these same solutions that worked well for free-to-play gaming, applying them for blockchain gaming, but also introducing some uh, new solutions to help companies with uh, drops or you know, creating a white-label marketplace too, but newer solutions for the company, but not the purpose of today's conversation. Um, this all, everything we do is built on top of some pretty deep insights into player behavior. And that's what I'm gonna talk about content here with the next best action. So it begins with understanding of player behavior and then what do you do with that information? And we do that right now with a uh, lot of good companies out there in mobile gaming. So let's just set the stage a little bit here in terms of current situation, right? So, you know, kind of the news flash, right? Data, you know, I, Apple, IDFA, I mean, now it's just taken for granted. It's not news flash, it's not kind of what we do. The reality situation is that what Apple's done in terms of deprecating IDFA and, you know, making it such to where then the traditional ways of well, game acquisitions are just not available. It's just harder and harder. It's no longer a reliable sort of path towards you know, acquiring players in a very profitable way. So becoming much more expensive, much more problematic to acquire new players in the game. Uh, result is, frankly, you need to you know, keep those people in your game as, as much as possible. It's also led to a fear of unknown. So because of what's going on in the, the marketplace, you know, ad tech companies buying ad tech, right? Bigger ones, right? Like app loving and you know, iron sources out there just you know acquiring different you know different smaller ad tech companies to but also mobile publishers so larger uh, studios acquiring either whole studios and jam city buying all of you know ludia or individual studios where you know, jam city bought some individual games and in portfolio accumulation right through acquisition you know it's not just you know recently you know this is going to be i think a trend that's going to continue and become even in many ways you know, more necessary as, as players go forward to acquire, you know, and this speaks directly. If, you've, if you read Mobile Dev Memo and you follow, you know, or Deke Scrimpel, you heard Eric Soifert talk about, you know, Content Fortress, and this is absolutely, you know, spot on and something we've also been talking about in our company for a while as far as, and key for portfolio strategies, just to, you know, have a large collection of games where you can drive one game to uh, another game. So path forward. So, you know, I mentioned earlier, so, so while IDFA is not available, it's no longer a reliable way to go out, you know, acquire new customers or go to your favorite ad network to do that. You do still have the ability to attract players within your own portfolio games. You have access to the IDFB, the identifier for vendors. So as long as it's within your own portfolio games, you can use that tracking information, you know, within Apple's privacy laws and then be able to actually direct people into different games you know, themselves. So that's um, kind of key. And that becomes now sort of, you know, just the cheeky barriers. And I'm going to hit these, think of the size from exact summary. I'm going to hit each one of these. So maximize IP revenue, you know, with promotional pricing, you know, is another key thing to do as far as next best action. Street promotion to, you know, higher LTV games becomes also strategic imperative now. And indeed, this is kind of the bulk of this conversation more so, you know, right now. One way, you know, tactical is feeder apps. So, you know, having you know, a bunch of, you know, low monetizing games, driving them to higher monetizing games, or LTV games. And then taking it to the next level in terms of cross promotion is actually creating a loyalty program to where, you know, taking people from your know, one hit game and driving over to your next hit game. So let's talk about each one of these elements, you know, on their own too. So first is uh, the promotional pricing. Right? So promotional pricing, again, one of the core things we do, this you can do yourself, gives a little bit of insights into some of the data, the behavior that we want to track here from, from players and what you can do yourself. So first you need a way to ingest data. You need insights into player behavior. I call these pricing signals. So there's a lot of information that's available for you then to, to use. So device information, the geolocation, these are signals of affluence. So even when someone first comes in your game, these right away tell you some information about the player, about willingness to maybe potentially make a purchase. 
when someone returns to your game, now I've got more data. Now I've got engagement data. Now I know like how long did they play for? What level did they actually go with in the game? Did you spend anything? You know, yes or no, when like that. How if you did spend, how much did you spend? So all these different signals. We translate those in price offers, right? This is the core of promotional pricing. And just to be clear, when I talk about promotional pricing, I'm not suggesting dynamic pricing where you're kind of, you know, where you become, your game becomes sort of like Uber in terms of surge pricing here. It's not at all what we're suggesting here. Um, but rather promotional pricing, those are the special offers in a game. They tend to either be time-based or event-based. So whenever some, a player goes to that, the kind of expectation is that they will go away. So it's a great opportunity to introduce per user pricing. So when someone goes to that, that the question is like, if, hey, if you already, you, if you haven't spent anything in the game, you're new to the game, I'm trying to convert you as quick as possible. You know, if you already are, you know, a spender in the game too, I'm trying to extend your lifetime value, right, in terms of optimal pricing. Really, that is really the core goal here. And then because we make predictions run churn, you're on the way out. You know, one last opportunity for one big spend. You know, as you play. That's promotional pricing. So, but what we want to do is talk about instead is um, for Portfolio management, and this is you know again not a new you know idea. You know companies have been buying other companies for a while, so I think you know Playtica for reason of genre, you know acquiring seriously in Wuga, right? You know not to be so dependent in the, the social casino you know, category. You have also then people just buying revenue, right? You know so even like you know, let's see, you know, Glue, you know acquiring Crydstar, you know Glue then getting acquired by EA, right? These are motions that require revenue, but it speaks directly to the requirement of the portfolio strategy. So company is recognizing that they need to get as many games as possible to cross promote in the game. And this way, so the things we want to track to drive cross promotion here is LTV and probability of return. And we want to keep moving people up to just move them up to the higher LTV games, you know, ideally, right? It depends on the scope of your portfolio game. So one tactic is a feeder app. So and this is why Zynga bought Rolex. This is why Rovio bought Ruby games, right? These are hyper, you know, again, they didn't fit in the portfolio of the games that these companies had before. They were hyper casual games, right? You know, and so with hyper casual games, they're kind of interesting, right? Because they used to make, you know, there are, you know, organic, you know, they tend to get downloaded, you know, pretty easily. So organic, so the cost of install is very low. They also have high churn, right? So that's, you know, so if you have a mixture, a nice mixture of hyper casual, with more IEP oriented game, you know, that's where the feeder app comes good. So try to move people as quickly as possible over to a more IEP oriented game. So that's one kind of feeder app strategy. Or even if you don't have that, even within your own games, just as many games as possible. So obvious being, you know, genre, and if you are idle games, you know, so like Hyper Hippos have a collection of, you know, we look at them, idle games, being able to cross promote those games is a, is a great way too. But also the LTV predictions, or just always, you know, at the end of the day, you know, game makes most money is a hit game. So you want to try to move people, migrate, you know, folks over to other hit games you have. Or if you're able to predict that churn, right? Knowing when someone is on the way out, similar to what I was talking about promotional pricing within your portfolio strategy and cross promotion, being like, okay, high monetize, you know, someone's going to be leaving their game. So rather than have them just churn and then go play someone else's game, great opportunity to put up some sort of interstitial, a banner, you know, encourage them to then download your next game that might be similar, just another LTV, you know, high LTV game, a new game. So next, taking the next phase um, of working together, of, of or working within your portfolio game. So one is to cross promotion to similar titles or moving it up to more LTV titles that we just talked about too. Um, loyalty program kind of takes it to the next level, right? You know, and so, and really what specifically I'm talking about is the idea of creating a cross game loyalty you know, program within your portfolio of games too. So you have a lot of games out there. We want to move people from one game to the next game. One way is to then going further, instead of just putting up a banner, hey, download this game, it's fun. Better still is, hey, download this game, you know, because I'm gonna give you some points, some loyalty points. I'm gonna come back to that. First, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what a loyalty program is, because the, the building blocks and starting point is to create a loyalty program for your game. And loyalty program, in this case, within the next best action framework is, first what we do is, well, first of all, a loyalty program is, it's pretty simple, right? You know, it's pick a favorite airline, your hotel, your coffee shop. Most businesses out there in the real world, they got loyalty programs. So they know, businesses know that the best thing, the way to grow your revenue is to take care of your current customers. 
So similar idea within mobile gaming, you want to have this loyalty program to exist outside of core gameplay. So hit that little gift box so that we customize your game. Go into this loyalty program. You can see these features are, they're, like, they're basically best, best practice engagement retention features, very familiar within game design. In our case, we're running it separately. And what we're doing is we want to attach points to that, right? And again, that's the arcade. It's something you can do. It's what we do, but it's something you can do is create points associated to it. Now, it's very important to actually really have a good sense of the game economy. You don't want to give away as much points away they have, because what you do with points is redeem them for stuff you sell. Right? So in-game currency, in-game items. The great thing about these items is there's, you know, it's no marginal cost, right? So it's, it's a great thing to give away versus, say, a car or some sort of a physical item. But understanding of your game economy is very critical, because the whole goal of a loyalty program here is what well, retention primarily. I'm trying to get people to come back more often, spend more time in the game. Wealthy features do that, but also it's the um, you know it's also to we want to encourage people by giving them items to purchase. They buy something, they get something for free. It works very similar to rewarded video, right? Where if like if I give you some currency, you go buy something. You're higher level in the game. Maybe you're having more fun. You also get an appreciation of what the value you get from making a purchase or buying something in the game too works exactly the same way. So we give away items, people will buy something, but we don't want to give away so much to where they have no incentive or reason to go back and make a purchase. Because that's really what we want to get people to drive IAP revenue. Everything we do as a company is built around trying to um, drive IAP revenue. So that's essentially what loyalty program is. And then really taking it to the um, you know, next level is a cross game. So this comes back to the next best action portfolio strategy is, you know, if you are fortunate enough to have a large portfolio of games, and so too, is create a common pool within your loyalty program. So instead of an individual game, so Panda Pop here, so instead of a, a Panda Pop loyalty program, it's a you know, company-wide you know, loyalty program across all of your games. So players happy along in loyalty program playing Panda Pop, going to the next level, getting a little bored in this game. That's again, going back earlier, what I was saying, you know, what do we want to predict? We want to predict lifetime value, we want to predict churn, right? So lifetime value, that helps us to know a little bit like what game we want to cross promote. We want to drive them into those games. Churn is when I want to know when, but the timing of when to do these offers too. So at that moment is when I want to say, check out Genies and Gems. But you don't want to like offer that Genies and Gems at the point where they're just getting engaged, just moving up, you know, starting their player journey, right? That's the timing of it becomes very key. But then rather than having churn out go to some other game, right? They're still, they're within my portfolio of games. So now they're playing my other game within there too. So um, and that's where we do that with the common pool of loyalty points. So points earned in one game can redeem in another game. Important point too, what you do, what you want to think about if you're doing yourself is figure out the exchange rate. So points earned in one game are not necessarily the same as points earned in another game, even if there's some similar tactics rolled in through. So that's a very careful consideration because it is a common pool of points. But then it's also a great opportunity to retargeting. Because as you know, so someone's already, because you have your SDK, or we have you know, SK in there, or you have your own signaling and tracking of the information there. As someone's now on the second game, you know, game B, maybe getting bored of that game, right? You know, well, maybe drive them to another higher monetizing game. You have a newer game portfolio, but you're not as fortunate to have such a broad portfolio. Bring them back to the game you knew that they liked before, right? And that's another way that cross game promotion um, can work very nicely. All right, here's um, off page one. I mean, this is sort of trying to pull it um, together, you know, a little bit here. Is um, so this is um, called next best action. Everything we do is next best action, right? So you know, next best action is the you know, it's you know, starts with the ingestion of data. You know, it is you know the the behavioral and the you know the, um, the contextual insights that we have with it, but then it's also combined in with the content factory with it. So. And the next best action is what we'd use for promotional pricing, is what we'd use for you know, cross-game promotion, and what you'd use also for a cross-game loyalty program too. So it begins, but give you an idea of how kind of we're thinking about sort of the flow from data that you do yourself. And so start, look at John here. John is, we, you know, this is descriptive analytics, right? So how are we getting, we're getting some information on John. Actually, I don't really know his name, but just give me his name. But yeah, I know he's got an iPhone, I know his model of iPhone, right? I know. He's from the country of Sweden. Actually, know whether or not he's in an urban area, you know, or you know, non-urban. That's a pretty good you know, signal for influence as well. I know what he's spent so far. I know what 
Now I'm having my predictions of you know, lifetime value for them. That's, that's descriptive analytics. But I also have some predictive analytics on, on John. So predictive analytics is, you know, actually this is, and how do I have that? This is where the machine learning comes in because I've analyzed, you know, the players, other players who have similar characteristic, descriptive characteristics as John has here. So John is a player who plays at noon, he plays afternoon. You know, I already have a notion of normal session length. I have a notion of you know, how much he spends, if he is a spender already in the game, how quickly he might spend his money. Um, but that's why then based on that, I have some predictions for him. On top of that, then I've already now run some, you know, counterfactual simulations, right? That's the, you know, AI BS of the piece. I'm evaluating, and what I'm doing is I'm evaluating LTV impacts by running counterfactuals on a whole host of different scenarios. So all a bunch of if and when, you know, type of sort of scenarios run LTV. And so what is the most interesting then is when unexpected behavior happens, right? So we have a notion of John's regular player behavior within the game. And it's when something unexpected, like if he normally plays or purchases at a certain time, then he goes out of that norm. That's kind of like what you can imagine, sort of like ringing out alarms, not really alarms. We don't really have alarms in our office. But if we were, you know, that would be the idea. So that's what signals to the engine to let us know, okay, there's an opportunity for intervention. But we've already run the counterfactual simulations in advance. We may do nothing with that information. But we already have a notion and sense of what game. Because, like, again, what I'm saying earlier is it's a combination of LTV predictions combined with churn predictions that makes this most interesting and most effective for driving a portfolio strategy because we've already determined there would be game B because game B has that $22 of lifetime value. Also, we're tracking portfolio value, $45 of value. So that would be the game we promote potentially with that. And then taking, because that's the last element there is influence. So with the insights into player behavior, expect just what they're doing, we're always trying to influence that. And then going back that again, that's kind of the, the three core things I talked about within strategies. You know, so promotional pricing, it's always influencing it with it's the right price, right time, right location, whether it's trying to, you know, convert, you know, a, a player into a payer as quickly as possible, or it's trying, it's trying to extend the lifetime value of, you know, an existing payer in the game. Similarly with cross promotion, this is all the same data, same information about cross reasoning. Similar with cross promoting, knowing when someone's maybe churning out of the game is the perfect opportunity to cross promote someone. And then going further, if you've been able to, you know, create some sort of loyalty program, you know, way of rewarding, you know, your, your, your players, you know, that becomes another opportunity to, to take it to the next level. And that's it. And then in the real time, this is the content factory. It's assembly expression of value, you can call it. So this is assembling the, what the offer is, right? And that could be a price offer. That could be a, a, a promo banner, you know, for the um, download. It could be, you know, talking about different features of the world, talking about different matter. It could be an ad. And if the game is a little more ad oriented, but real time, you know, is generating the, the creative you know, for it, you know, what right color, what's the call to action, and also what the offer is, is for that. And that pulls gear next best action framework. One minute left. I won't get into that. So yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, time's right now for, you know, it's critical to do have a portfolio strategy within your game. It's, you know, harder than ever. To acquire new players, so keep them around as long as possible. You know, by using the data, whether it's a loyalty program, but also knowing when people are going to leave. You know, it's a great opportunity to cross promote. And then finally, you know, pricing is all about trying to maximizing the the, the revenue from the per user basis. Thank you. Any questions or time? Well, I'm also, yeah, I didn't mention, so we are actually here also tomorrow. We have a table outside the VIP room if you're shy, you know, or just, you know, if it's secret, you just had such a good question, you want to keep it one on one, um, that's fine. Um, but I'll be here also tomorrow as well. So, yeah, B2 is the table. WAPIR is the company name, a little banner. <laughs>